Welcome to episode 52 of the Necronama.com. H-U-G-L-I-F-E. The hate you gave little infant. U-C-K, everybody. Meaning, what you feed us as seeds grows and blows up in your face. That's the life. I live the life, but let the money come to me. Because they can never take the game from a young seed. I'm getting money. I mean that shit, cause these white folks see us as thugs. I don't care what y'all think. I don't care if you think you a lawyer, if you a man, if you an African American, if you whatever the fuck you think you are. We thugs and niggas to these motherfuckers, son. You know? And until we own some shit, I'ma call it like it is. How you gonna be a man and we start? You know? And we, I mean, you can walk by five different houses, ain't a man in either one of them motherfuckers. How we gonna be a man? How we gonna be African American? We out here today. We thugs and we niggas until we set this shit right. Trust me when I tell you. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to right now, and odds are I'm going to cry doing this episode. Fuck you, I don't care. And I am Donald R. Guillory, author, historian, educator. And I'm Don Guillory, and I really don't give a fuck anymore. What was that? Why'd you introduce yourself twice? I... Because there's this great thing called code switching where I speak one way with one audience and I speak another way with another audience. Kind of sounds like this. Hi, good day. What's up? Or my favorite, would you look at that? Or check out this motherfucker over here. <laughs> Ah, uh, you know, let's just start there. Let's start with what is code switching? And it's not that I think our audience is dumb by any means, but our audience comes here to learn. So please tell us what is code switching? Why do people do it? And how does it legitimately help save lives? Well, I, you you answered part of your question there or part of one of your questions. Code switching is is about survival. Uh, you know, one about physical survival but then it's also about surviving within one, one's career. Uh, code switching is the ability for people in marginalized communities, because it's not just a black thing. You have it with Hispanics, you have it with Asians, you have it with immigrant groups, uh, where there's one way you have to be behave around a general or mainstream audience. I won't even say a white audience or white group, but a general audience. And then there's two... Um, how you behave around your close friends, your family, people from your from a similar background to, I guess, you know, somewhat remain uh, retain your authenticity. And I think I guess one of the best examples other than the film that we're going to talk about is those of you who've seen the Chappelle show. There's one skit where it's called, you know, when keeping it real goes wrong. And it's about a black executive and the one white guy or his white friend, his white mentor at the meeting tells him at one moment like hey you know give me some skin or some bullshit type thing when when they have a great meeting and dave Chappelle's character snaps because he's he's been so used to playing that role to get get ahead in corporate america get ahead in college and stuff where he's like i'm fucking tired of this and goes off on the guy if you haven't seen it i'm not going to ruin it anymore it's 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 a true part of dave Chappelle or true reflection of dave Chappelle's genius uh, but the character goes off and loses everything. But again, I'm not going to ruin the humor of it because it, it's a it's a great sketch. Cool. Yeah, I I haven't seen it actually, so I'm going to check it out. I think it's a uh, first season of of Chappelle Show. Uh, but you know, like I said, it's about survival as well. So I mean, about physical survival as well, because sometimes. Uh, there's an issue, you know, where you might be in public and the police are around or someone of authority is around and, and you know, there's a certain way that you have to disarm them. And sometimes it's, it's disarming them by your speech or speech patterns, because, you know, if I were to speak one way, it's going to be threatening. If I speak another way, it's going to be, you know, like I said, it's, it's going to be non-threatening and disarming. And it sucks that we have to do that, but you know, that's, kind of where we are oh it's more than kinda <laughs> um yeah you know 
let's just jump straight into this film really fast. Um, obviously, code switching is huge in this film. Yes. Uh, you have star version one, star version two. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But my my first thing I want to talk about is the very beginning of the film, which okay. is the talk. And uh, you've you've talked about the talk before on past episodes, but if you could just give us another summary here for people that haven't heard it, and then um, just just kind of even just explain how you code switch talking to a cop when you get pulled over. That that's where I'm tying this in, and I, okay. I think that that's probably the most important thing here. Well, code switching, or at least the talk that that Star has with her dad, um, it's. It's a talk that takes place with black families and Hispanic families. I can't speak for 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 Asian and indigenous families, but it's a it's a talk that takes place in black and Hispanic households all over this country. Like if you get pulled over, this is what you do. If this happens, this is what you do. Because and the parents always end that conversation with. The most important thing is that you come home to me. I don't give a shit, you know, about your pride at that moment. Don't sit there, argue with the cop. Don't do anything, you know, because they can use any excuse that they want to say, I fear for my life or, or, you know, you were a troublemaker. You did this because, you know, odds are our parents have seen some shit go down have seen it happen to them, you know, to, to friends of theirs, to people that they know. I didn't know this until I was well into adulthood. My mother was pulled over by the police because she had a nice car and she had had the talk with me before. And, and, and it was never a, a consideration of like, you know, my mom is career military. My mom is, you know, you know, came up from rural Virginia, made something of herself, has money, you know, never really worries about finances at all because, you know, she, she's got, you know, she was professional. She's got, you know, advanced degrees. And she tells me one day, she's like, yeah, you know, I got pulled over because I had a Mercedes uh, SUV, uh, your aunt Glory, her twin, we got pulled over and uh, her friend Lillian was in the car with us. And the cop thought that because we were driving a nice car, we must have been selling drugs, detained us for an hour and was trying to get Lillian. Lillian is Puerto Rican from New York and she passed. She can pass as white. And the cop pulled her aside and said, hey, we know they're doing something. If you just tell us, we'll let you go. Not understanding that this woman was my my aunt's girlfriend. So, you know, just try it. And she sat there after they were finally done, like searching the vehicle and found nothing that, you know, my aunt, uh, aunt Lily, my my aunt Gloria's girlfriend was like, yeah, they fucking tried to get me to drop a dime on you guys. So they would let me go because the police officer thought that she was white, had no idea. You know, he's, he, this was in Georgia, had no fucking idea what a Puerto Rican was. <laughs> And she knew what was going on, so she didn't out herself because she figured, well, if I tell him that I'm Puerto Rican, then we probably got another problem. And, you know, the the going back to the talk itself, my mother herself was so ashamed at this incident that she didn't feel comfortable talking to me about this until, you know, I was probably about 30. Uh, oh, and wow. this was way after I had had my first run in with the police where it was just simply I drove through a neighborhood and. You know, my my friend at the time joked about it. Uh, it was like late at night after we gotten off of work. It was my first job at Taco Bell. You know, I stayed to to, you know, stayed behind because I was his ride. And we were driving home, drove through a neighborhood on the way back to his house. And the police pulled us over two cop cars. And it seemed like no matter what I said to this police officer, it wasn't good enough. It, you know, it's like, hey, what are you guys doing? Just came back from work. I'm wearing jeans and a T-shirt because it had been several hours since I had, you know, finished my shift because I was just sitting there waiting for him to 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 finish up around 11. He still got his hat on. He asked me this question, then asked my friend this question. He's like, yeah, we just got off of work. OK, you know, it's just kind of like one of these things like I just fucking told you that <laughs> Like, I'm the one who's driving. I, you know. It was just pissing me off, but I'm sitting there like, no, this is fucked up. This is fucked up. 
Uh, I got home late that night. I didn't tell my mom what happened because I felt like I was the one who was wrong. Like I had done something because you're always taught, hey, you know, if the police pull you over, it's, it's you did something, not or at least that's the way you're taught within movies and media. Like you had to have been doing something to get pulled over by the police or the police must be well within their right to do this because why would they bother you? And, but, you know, even if he couldn't tell I was black, you know, because it was nighttime, there was definitely a different interaction between the two of us uh, when he pulled me over because it was just very fucking rude. Uh, another incident, a friend of mine was in the vehicle with me uh, and she, you know, to this day, I'll even thank her for like being in the car because it was an overzealous Georgia state trooper who pulled me over and it, you know, he pulled me over for a non moving violation off the highway, which is weird because it was like window tent, which was a non moving violation. Um, so he pulls us over, pulls out the little, the, the tester thing to determine like the, the percentage of tent that you have. He couldn't see her from the driver's side, which again is weird. He walks around to the passenger side to test the tent because it's dangerous for him to be standing right next to the road where he get hit by a car. She says the look on his face was like he saw a fucking ghost because she was a white, red haired, older woman. And she just (laughs) rolls down the window and he he looked as though he had seen a fucking ghost. When we get down the road, she just starts laughing. I'm like, what the fuck is so funny, Paulette? Because when he when I roll down the window, he checks, you know, he checks it. and He's like, OK, well, you're good. You know, I'll just let you off with a warning and then goes back to his car. We drive off and Paul, it's like he didn't even fucking turn the thing on. I'm like, what are you talking about? He saw me, got scared, pushed the thing against the window and was like, oh, yeah, you're good. You can go. And so we just sat there and I'm like, are you fucking? I was like, thank God you were in the car because he could have pulled any type of bullshit on me. Wait, hang on. It actually checks the tent to the window. It was I supposed- thought that the I thought the point was to check it against your skin. Yeah, well, he could have done that. I've seen Family Guy. I know how it works. <laughs> no, it's fucked up. Um, you know, as long as we're telling these stories before we move on, I want to I want to tell you one of mine. So I'm driving along. I'm doing 75 and a 55. And uh, it's like it's like maybe six in the morning. I'm on my way to an, am- an amusement park with some friends. Right. All of us in the car are white. So this cop comes flying at me from the other direction, jumps the fucking ditch between us and like like Duke's a hazard pulls me over. OK, he gets out. He comes up to my window and he says, I clocked you at eighty five. Now, this is where our experiences are going to differ. Right. And I say, that's fucking ridiculous. I was going 75 and a 55. I said, (laughs) that's fucking ridiculous. I was going 75 and a 55. And he says, I clocked you at 85. And I said, I was staring at my speedometer. I was doing 75. I'm arguing that I'm 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. This sounds like a shitty auction. (laughs) (laughs) And the cop... Gave me a warning and sent me on my way. Yeah, I think I might have had a felony stop on that one. And those of you who aren't aware, a felony stop is when the police tell you to get out of your vehicle and have guns drawn on you. And then uh, you're supposed to get on your knees behind your vehicle. And then they uh, put handcuffs on you and you sit on the curb. And then they toss your car. Um, I... Thankfully, that hasn't happened to me. Uh, that's happened to people I've, I've uh, in my family, people I know of. Um, the the one of the the two other things, and of course, then we'll get to the film. Uh, there was one bright spot, and this is one of those things of uh, I guess using privilege to your advantage or using uh, whatever you have it to your advantage. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, as a as a military veteran. Um, sometimes people forget our skin color when they see, because what they see more before they see, you know, our skin color is the word veteran or the branch that's tied to it, you know, whatever the hell you happen to have on your person or on your vehicle. I was speeding in my own neighborhood because I misread the signs. 
I thought the signs were like 35, you know, through our little subdivision, you know, the, the, the streets that run between the subdivisions. Apparently it was 25. So I was going like 37. Seems safe. I get pulled over like 50 feet outside of my uh, outside of my subdivision in the in the in the through street by motorcycle cop. And the joke always is if a motorcycle cop puts the kickstand down, you're getting a ticket. (laughs) And, you know, he he pulls me over, says, hey, you know, do you know why I pulled you over? And I was like, oh, I said, no. He's like, well, you were speeding. You know, you're going, you know, uh, 38. Uh, and the speed limit is 25 and said, Oh, I'm sorry. I, you know, I, and this was that code switching. I'm like, Oh no, I'm sorry. I thought, I thought the speed limit was 35 here. And I've been living here several years. I, I, I did, I wasn't aware of the speed limit. And, um, you know, he's like, Oh, you know, no, you know, sorry, sir, but I got to give you a ticket for it. And I was like, okay, cool. Uh, because it's kind of like, well, I fucked up. I wasn't paying attention. He goes back, starts writing a ticket and I'm looking at him in the rear view. And I see, oh, fuck. He hangs his head and he starts walking back to me and apologizes because he's seen my tags. And they are Arizona vet, you know, veteran tags. He walks up and is like, sir, I'm so sorry for this. I am so sorry. I don't want to give you this. T- but I already made the ticket out. And I'm sitting there thinking like, well, if you don't want to give me the fucking ticket, you don't have to give me the ticket. Right. You don't but, have to hand it over. Yeah. But he's like, I already put it into the system. you know. And then I saw your plate. And I'm like, I'm so sorry to do this to you. And I'm thinking like, have I gotten out of tickets before? Because somebody just saw my plates. And and I have, I have a joke with a couple of friends. I'm like, I have veteran shit you know, on my, on my plates, on my laptop, you know, all this stuff. Because... I figure that's one thing to disarm somebody as part of the code switching. That's one thing to disarm somebody from harassing me or bothering me uh, compared to, you know, 50, 60 years ago where it might get my ass beat for, you know, being in uniform uh, in certain parts of this country, which you know, to be honest, there are some parts of this country where if you are a person of color and you're wearing a uniform with, with, uh, with bars or birds, uh, somebody will probably still fuck with you. Um, the, the other instance or one of the other instances where I had, it was in college where we were in the dorm. There was a guy who was pulled over on campus, drunk driving. He was a white frat guy. Gets pulled over. One of his frat buddies sees that he's been pulled over, assembles like 10 of of the frat bros (laughs) while he's in cuffs in the back of this vehicle Outside of our dorm, we're watching all this shit go down. These 10 frat bros are arguing with the cop about, and it's it's like 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. You need to let him go. You know, we can take care of him. We'll take him back home. We'll do this. We'll, you know, we'll make sure that everything's fine, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure there was a, a couple of, do you know who my dad is type remarks. And so my friends and I, we were sitting there watching this from our dorm on the third floor. And we start getting pissed off because we're like, are you fucking – and the window's open, so you can hear – we can hear what they're saying. They can probably hear what we're saying. And it's just like, are you fucking kidding me? Really? You're going to let this guy go? He takes the cuffs off the guy, takes him out of the back seat, takes the cuffs off of him, then lets him go off with his friends. And one of the other friends drives the car back to their their dorm or their house or whatever. I was at the, 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 uh, the frat house. One of the guys that's with us, you know, yells out, I was like, are you fucking kidding me? If that had been me, I would have been in the back of the fucking car and been taken to jail. I said, but you let this guy go. This cop, and I think the guy said something like, you know, you know, if 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 he were black, you would have you would have taken him to jail. So it's clear who said, you know, somebody who was black who said it, you know, just from the university and where we were. This cop threatens to arrest the entire floor of the dorm because we disagreed with a DUI uh, uh, arrest and then release. Wow. And the only person who stopped him was the the security guard, which, you know, it was a student as 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 an assistantship who who was, I guess, pre-law and told the cop downstairs, he's like, you can't do that. He's like, well, I'm not going to let them, you know, these black kids talk to me, whatever. He's like, you can't arrest them because they disagreed with you now. Mind you, think about how many times that has probably taken place within this country where somebody with their, you know, six months of training, if that felt that they could do whatever the fuck they wanted to because they have a badge. 
Ah, Jesus. <laughs> this is um, America. <laughs> right. Okay, let's let's jump into the film. So yes. we've, we've been talking code switching. So one of my favorite things that I want to talk about really fast is with the actual filmmaking of yes. this film. And that's that every time that Star goes to Williamson, her her school that's not in the area where she lives, everything gets whitewashed. Her skin looks paler. Mm-hmm. The the scenes are like a blue tint. And I think that this is such a powerful little tiny thing to add. Like like little tiny as in it's an easy change. But holy shit, the symbolism of it, the impact of it is just fucking huge. Mm-hmm. But I, I really, really noticed how much it washed out her skin and how it made her less black. Oh, and it's thought, funny that you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. If those of you, because this book is, I'm sorry, this film is based on the book of the same name. On the cover of the book, it's a dark skinned female. In the film, they, they cast uh, Amanda Stern, Amanda Stenberg uh, to play Star, who is who is fairer skinned than the character on the book cover. And my feeling, one, she's a, she's a great actress, but two, I think this is about making it more palatable to a general audience. And it was in the movie itself, the changes that they made within the film uh, from the book, it was about making things. I, I guess more uh, more acceptable or more comfortable for a, a mainstream white audience. Uh, and some of the criticisms of the film were, you know, this movie was not made for a black audience. The book was made for a black audience. The film was made for a white audience. Because there, there were a lot of things that they didn't get into in the film that they, I'm sorry, a lot of things that they didn't get into the film that they, you know, they dove deep into within the book. And, but I do like the visual aspect of showing, you know, her experience at, at private school of she is a different person. She, she looks different. It's not just her hair. It's not just the way she dresses. It's her it's her demeanor is who she is. And it's that fear. And, and, and we talked about this earlier. It's that fear that she has even dealing with code switching. The fear she has of being exposed for who she is or at least having the real her emerge and almost feeling like, you know, something's wrong with her because she can't be her authentic self in uh, at her private school or prep school. And she can't share her private school world with the, you know, her friends from the neighborhood. Yeah, you know, I mean, we are an amalgamation of our experiences. And so she she literally can't share it with anyone. Like, even her own family wouldn't get it, totally. Like, even her brother who goes to school with her, it's going right. to be different for them. Uh, he's, he's probably the, the number one person she could talk to about it. But overall, it's going to be really fucking different with anyone else. And that's that's got to just be a horrible feeling at any age, let alone the worst age that you can be, you know? Also, can I just say her brother, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you know this, but I don't know mm-hmm. how many people that saw it understand her brother's name is seven mm-hmm. for a fucking reason. And that reason is 0.7 of the 10 point program of the black Panthers. And, and they, they distinctly say 0.7 in the film, but they don't, right. They don't say that's what we named you for, you know, like it's there and, and well, maybe they do say it, but it's it's fast if they do. They don't really concentrate on it. And I think it's so fucking important that that's his name, because point seven is we want an immediate end to police brutality mm-hmm. and the murder of black people. And I don't know if you've looked at the news lately or not, but uh, I feel like like maybe some people still are talking about that, huh? Well, oh, shit, that's is, right. All of us are. Jesus. What, well, what's weird is there are people who apparently and, – and I'm not going to fault them um, because if so, – for some of us, if we're not exposed to, to things, we don't learn about it. Like it was up until I was in college that I thought that Malcolm X was an asshole and the Black Panthers were terrorists. And I'm talking about 
I went to school in the 90s. It's not like now where you can yeah. easily access this stuff and find out, holy shit, they actually got their start because of a, a, a of a group in Alabama. And that's where they got the name from because of these social programs that were going on. Holy shit. They showed up to the the, the state capitol in, in California with guns because they wanted to express how they needed to police their own neighborhoods because of all the violence and the, the ways that the cops were beating the shit out of people. And then Reagan came out on the side of gun control in 1967. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but just just the fact that in 1967, when when they emerged or when they were merged and were gaining traction, that they're already talking about police brutality. Or at least making police brutality a, a, a pillar of who they are and what they stand for. And that, you know, here we are in, in 2020. And there are people who still are, you know, I, I guess there's no other way to say it than 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 caping for for the police and not understanding that not all cops are good. I mean, mm. there are, there are plenty of officer friendlies, but there are plenty of of officer assholes. And the yeah. problem is, and this is even something that that the the Panthers were approaching, like you can't. You can't tell us about the officer friendly when we see the guy who's, you know, beating my dad or my mom over the head with a billy club because, you know, she just happened to say something he didn't like. Like these people need to be gone. They need to be fired and they need to be in jail. And we all need to collectively stop protecting those guys because that's not who we want to have. It's not somebody I would want to have in my neighborhood, you know, patrolling. And I have to worry about whether or not, uh, you know. Like this is a this is a common fear, and it whether I have to worry about the college students I see, you know, a random black college student I see, and this this was just from last week, jogging and sitting there thinking like, fuck, maybe I should offer him a ride. He's exercising. I know he's exercising, but somebody around here might do something, might claim something, and I would I would just feel really fucked up if I got home and checked the news and said, hey, you know, this this young man's body was found in a ditch. Because for those of you who are, who are new to this, I'm currently living in Mississippi, and one of the most famous cases involving a young male uh, sparked a sparked a movement. So, you know, if you don't know about Emmett Till or about the, the story of Emmett Till, I highly suggest that, one, you kick the shit out of your history teacher, and then, two, um, metaphorically speaking, um, you, you, you gripe to your history teacher about not learning it, and then, two— you look up the information about Emmett Till, what what took place, why his mother decided to have an open casket funeral, because she wanted to show the ugly face of racism, like what it does. And that was what the Panthers were doing in, in their movement, their initial movement. It was about exposing the violence that they were seeing on a daily basis and saying, like, look, we're not you know, we want to police our own communities. We want to take care of our communities. We want to make sure that. You know, people who are, you know, obeying the law or at least trying to conduct themselves as normal human beings aren't brutalized. <laughs> like, I should be able to go into a store and if if it turns out that the money I was using was fake, which there's no telling how many of us have had counterfeit bills or how many of us have had those counterfeit bill checkers themselves um, falsely read something as as counterfeit. And that's a simple thing of like, hey, man, this 20 is not real. Do you have anything else you can pay for? As opposed to I'm going to call the cops and that becomes a death sentence. I'm sorry. Long answer. No, that's good. I've uh, I've been thinking like I, I literally want to get those little pens and give them out to my friends. That way, like when you're at the store and they give you a 20, you can fucking check it so that you don't take it somewhere and use it. Well, the, the other thing is those those counterfeit checker things, those pens, they can show a false reading. And I, I was looking this up. If you happen to have fabric softener on on the dollar bill, like it can read it as being fake because the the because our money is is not paper. Well, I'm sorry, it's it's cotton, or, or cotton is used to make the the uh, the currency. So you have something that attaches to it. It it can block the 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 reading. Wow, what a great reason to die. Yeah. 
All right. So the the movie itself, and, and you and I have talked about this before. I suggested that we talk about this this film earlier into our show. Um, and the issue for me was when I first saw this movie, I'm like, this is a fucking horror movie. This is not some feel good, you know, bullshit coming of age story um, where, you know, it's about a young teen girl who falls in love and is, you know, worried about the big dance and all that shit. What it does, it the movie, different from the book, the movie offers that perspective, but it shows you all the weight that Star has to deal with. She's living in two two different worlds. She has two different versions of herself. She's fully exemplifying what's known, uh, I'm sorry, what is coined by uh, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois as the double consciousness. Of, and, and the short version is basically that you have to be black and you have to be American. Like you're always aware that these these identities are separate. There's a little bit of overlap, but you're not going to be seen. You're going to be seen as one or the other. And I mean, that, that's a basic way of getting into it. He, he has a, uh, a a nice I shouldn't even say nice, a very in-depth uh, look at what it actually means. Uh, in I think the book, The Souls of Black Folk, but he also has essays about it. Um Souls of Black Folk is available on PDF. I suggest you buy it so the you know the money goes back to uh, his family and 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 organizations. Um, but it she's got all this going on, all the normal teenage shit. But then she also has to deal with the fact that she goes to a house party, and you know somebody shoots at the house party. She leaves with a friend of hers, a childhood friend that she kind of had a crush on young, you know, when they were younger and stuff. They're in the car. The police pull them over, or at least police hit them with the lights. And you've already gotten a glimpse of the dad having the talk with him like, this is what you do. Hands at 10 and 2 on the wheel. Don't move quickly. Whatever. Yes, ma'am. No. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, ma'am. No, sir. When the police officer talking to you. Make sure you speak clearly. Make sure they can see your hands. You're looking at them, all this stuff, right? Uh, if you're a passenger, hands on the dashboard so they, they don't think you're doing anything. So that should still be fresh in your mind because it's only about 10 minutes after this discussion takes place when this event when this event happens. So she's in the car with her friend, and he, uh, Khalil, uh, Khalil is the, the, the friend. Khalil gets pulled over. They're listening to Tupac talking about it, and he's explaining to Tupac what it means, you know, what the song means and all this other stuff. And the police officer approaches after he's pulled him over and basically says, hey, you need to do this, this, and this. And Star is sitting there with her hands on the dashboard like, Khalil, don't move, don't move, don't do anything. And he starts arguing with the cop and says, hey, you know, why'd you pull us over and all this other stuff. Gets the information, um, he's outside the car, putting his hands on, you know, on the side of the car to, to let the police officer know that he's not a threat and being a young teenager and being a young teenager, we're often stupid and we forget where we are sometimes he reaches for his hairbrush cause he wants to fix his hair. You know, it's, it's a nervous thing that he has. And in the book, they, they explain that a little bit more is that he would, he would do certain things when he was nervous or when he was lying and, you know, uh, Star points this out very br- briefly in the movie, but it goes in more depth in the book. And he's just nervous, a nervous kid. So he reaches for his brush and he's also reaching, you know, to, to check on Star and like, hey, are you OK? Are you OK? Is everything fine? The police officer, without seeing him, assumes that he's pulling out a gun and shoots him. Now, when this happens in the movie, I saw this in the movie theater. I'm expecting it from the book. I know what's about to happen. But it happens so quickly. There's no music to set it up like you would have in a typical horror movie. The tension that's already there is driving you to say, like, oh, this is not a good situation. This is not a good situation. This is not a good situation. It's the same feeling I had when I watched by accident uh, the the Alton Sterling murder and then also the George Floyd murder. Because you're seeing someone's life come to an end on video. You're seeing that, you know, you're seeing them die at that moment. And when it hits in this film, you know, all those moments come back. You're like, fuck it, Emmett Till 
Alton Sterling, Trayvon Martin, you're here, you know, uh, Brianna Taylor, Sandra Blank, you're, you're seeing all these faces and knowing ain't shit going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. You know, this cop is going to get on desk duty or he might be suspended or something might happen, but he, he's still going to go back to his job. And, you know, when the suspension's over, when the investigation's over, because all he has to say is, I thought he was reaching for a gun. Which is what, you know, which is, is what the officer argues It's like, you know, I was I thought he was reaching for a gun. I was I was concerned, um, which when this happens, the, the full horror that star has to deal with gets imagined because now it's not just about being scared of, you know, the police officer is being scared of being the, scared of the police officer, being scared of people in her own neighborhood uh, being scared of these two worlds colliding and then also being scared of, holy shit, I'm not a fraud. Everybody else is a fraud. And when there's a, a, a protest that's held at the school, you know, a, a, I guess a copycat Black Lives Matter protest, she's thinking, oh, great. You know, people in my community or people in my school, they, they, they get it. They understand what people like my, my community are going through. And then she realizes the kids at her her predominantly white school, her predominantly white private school, are using this as an excuse to get out of classes. And it just pisses her off more because it's like, you don't fucking understand. You don't get this. You, you don't understand what's going on. And she's having to hear all these conversations because she's been so good at code switching that friends that she's had for years don't see her as a black kid. And which brings me up to one of the most dangerous statements anybody can say. And it's one that I roll my eyes out and I and I and and, you know, I hesitate to call them stupid motherfuckers when I hear it. But when someone says. I don't see color. I don't see it. You're not really black to me. You're just another human being. And I get that. But the problem is, and, and this film brings it out, this film illustrates it. The problem is, if you don't see someone's color, you don't see their experiences. Now, that's not to be confused with don't judge someone based off their color. But understand that if you are a black person in this country, and as you and I have talked about earlier, you have a different experience with the cops. You have a different experience in classrooms. You have a different experience... With your friends, sometimes it I mean, comes down literally to, everywhere. Well, I mean, there's there's good experiences because I'll be honest, I like when I go to college uh, college arenas to go watch a game, and then some some oblivious fan thinks like, oh shit, that's the guy he used to play here ten years ago. I know him, and you're sitting there like, no, I did, I never played. I, I'm a fucking clumsy dude, man. I, I played football on Madden. I can't do it. I'm like, no, man, you don't have to joke with me. I know that's you. And I'm like, yeah, that's me. That's number uh, 25 up there on the banner. Holy shit. You're Wilt Chamberlain? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I know Wilt Chamberlain's number 13 before anybody says some shit. <laughs> yeah, but, but yep. the fan doesn't because he's that stupid. Right. Uh, I, I still think that you should tell him you were on the Quidditch team. I'm just saying. I think I did say that one time, and somebody's like, "Wow!" I was like, "Yeah, man, I was the I was the great. I had the seeker. I had the highest seeker points ever." <laughs> um, but yeah, that you see how these worlds start to collide, and what Star has to deal with now is she doesn't want that added pressure. She doesn't want that added attention, and and all honesty, she wants to be that cat that that kid who keeps her head down. Doesn't want to get involved in any of this shit. She's forced to. And now it's, hey, if you want Khalil's killer to be brought to justice, you need to say something about it. You need to speak. And she makes the mistake, as gets illustrated in the book and in the movie. She makes the mistake of taking an interview. Because people start putting two and two together in her neighborhood. And they're like, oh, shit, that's Star. We know that's her. We know she's friends with Khalil. She left the party with Khalil. We know it's her. and so it just becomes this thing of she can't avoid it, and she never fully addresses like, oh yeah, that was me in the car until later in the film. But it becomes very questionable, or at least people start questioning, you know, her motives for for this. But what's really interesting is is Star's fears 
again start coming up because now that she's spoken out, she's got to worry about people like King coming after her because Khalil reveals to her in the car that you know he had been selling drugs to make ends meet to, because there were no jobs, there weren't any opportunities. So he's selling drugs for King. He's selling drugs to make sure that you know he can take care of his family or at least you know provide for his family. Uh, he's not doesn't have the ability to go to college, can't get a trade. You know, it, it, there are so many opportunities that that are that are closed off from him. And King's big issue is can talk to the police. They probably know what I've been doing, or he probably, you know, he might have said something to her in the car about, you know, all the stuff I've been doing. And now the police are probably going to look at me and try and, you know, try in order to silence her. They're going to or as part of silencing her, they're going to come after me. So there's just this, this big clusterfuck of things going on to where you start to understand. And she explains this again in the book and in the movie. Of her fear wasn't just speaking up and speaking out against the police. It was the blowback of people at my school are going to know it's me and they're going to know what things are like in, in my neighborhood. And I can't be the fake star anymore. I can't be star number two. And number one, I'm going to have to worry about the safety, you know, in my own neighborhood, in my own home. One thing I liked about the movie that they didn't that they changed from the book is that they show them spending more time in the neighborhood and dealing with these situations, dealing with this idea of being silenced or being afraid to come forward, because that's something a lot of people in, in, in some of these, these communities have complained about is we can't necessarily come forward and tell the police because we can't trust you to do the right thing. And if we do speak out against you or speak, speak out uh, for crime or anything like that, you might not get the people that are responsible. And then my family is going to be a target. So that, that aspect becomes one of those things. But what's great is they have the 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 activist who's played by by Issa Rae, April, um, who's played by by Issa Rae. Her name is April in the film, where she's talking about justice and she's talking about how, you know, we need to get these bad cops out of here. We need to actually do something about it. And the thing is, we don't have anybody who's advocating. We don't have anybody that that is w- really willing to come forward. Now, of course, now because of the film, you have Star who's coming forward and speaking out against it or speaking out about it. And she gets her great opportunity to speak up at a rally. And at that moment, she clears up all these things that she's heard at the school, in her neighborhood, and on the news because she's seen how Khalil gets destroyed. His narrative gets destroyed in the news, where it's not about and, and they bring this up in the in, in the in the book. It's not about how, you know, they love playing Harry Potter, watching the Harry Potter movies and pretending they were wizards and all this other stuff. It's not about which she, you know, included. It's not about it was this kid with a great smile and dimples. It was this kid who loved, you know, his favorite sports team. It was this kid who read this. It was the kid who did this or the fact that, you know, he was you know, selling drugs to make ends meet because there were no opportunities. It was now, oh, he's just a drug dealer. was just getting rid of another problem on the street. Oh, oh, you know, this guy was probably going to kill this cop. There was no gun in the car. There were no drugs in the car. He was probably going to do this to the police officer. Um, and she gets this moment where, you know, the, the megaphone gets handed to her and she speaks her truth, which is, one of the greatest fears that we all have is public speaking. And within the last couple of weeks, I've seen a good number of people who've who've done the same thing as what you see in this film, which is speaking up when they were afraid to speak up because of whatever reason. I'm going to lose friends. I'm going to lose a job. I'm going to lose, you know, family members aren't going to want to talk to me. I've seen some atrocious things in the past week where people have disowned their own family members for speaking up against pol- police brutality. Or for simply changing their profile picture to, you know, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter or something like that. But what Star does at this moment is she uses her voice to clear up what was going on. And she says these very poignant words about how Khalil's life mattered. Everything that you're hearing about him is a lie. He didn't have a gun. He had a hairbrush. The cop shot him over a hairbrush. I saw him. Didn't render aid. The police were covering up 
In fact, when she was pulled into the police station, they tried to, you know, get her to change her story, at least get get an interview from her to where it seemed like, oh, no, Khalil's the one who wasn't wrong. It wasn't the cop. And, you know, just talking about how she had been threatened by people in the police and uh, pe- people in the police department and how she wasn't, you know, able to sleep, how there were threats at the home and just showing what people go through more than just what you would typically see on the news them going through. And, and then you see how the city, you know, just it erupts because people have, have expressed their outrage about the protests and riots uh, and looting. But that is something that has taken place in this country, you know, for hell, since since the 1770s. It is taking place because when there's civil unrest, and that civil unrest is not being addressed. People react a certain way. People are going to react a certain way. It, it's it's part of human human behavior and human activity. Um, and what you see in a lot of these cities when there are urban rebellions and urban ru- uprisings, it's beca- because those systemic issues have not been addressed. It's because you've treated people so poorly that that rage, once you know, it, it is it can only be bottled up so much. There are only so many times you can see these things take place to where you erupt yourself. And that's what takes place in this film. There's so much that that happens that could have been dealt with in a pro, in an appropriate way to prevent any of that violence from taking place. But what you also see are people who are opportunists. People who then take the protests and the riots as an excuse of, hey, let's just break into this shit. Hey, let's go steal this. Let's go do that. Um, which, again, isn't an I'm never going to say it's an inappropriate or an appropriate way. I'm just going to say that it happens. And in the film, you see how uh, King even tries to take advantage of it, of like, oh, you know, well, shit, we can probably kill Star and her friends so they don't say anything about me and the drug dealing or they can't do anything to me about this. A great part of the film that it, I'm sorry, part of the book that is not included is when the gangs come together, like the, the OGs get together to protect Star, but also to protect the neighborhood. Because there's this running up to when there's going to be a march, and the OGs who are being led by, by Seven, uh, by, by, uh, oh my gosh. Well, actually, Seven's involved in it as well. But Maverick. being, being, met, being led by Maverick, he assembles all these old gangsters. And some young gangsters and says, we're going to protect these neighborhoods because we know what the fuck happens when there's a protest and a march. Shit can go down. So so you protect this store. You protect this part of the neighborhood. You protect this person's house. So they have a concerted effort to protect the neighborhoods. And a lot more stuff burns down in the movie than, than in the book. But they get together and they say, like, this is what we're going to do to protect this neighborhood, to keep it from falling apart, which would have been a great thing to show in the film, because that's something that takes place in these in these urban rebellions and in these urban uprisings. In the 92 L.A. riots, the Crips and the Bloods came together in Chicago. What's just happened? I I think the Crips, the Bloods, the Vice Lords, the Latin Kings have like all come together to like police their neighborhoods to stop shit from happening. And you see this in other cities throughout the United States where, you know, we know what the police are doing. We've been talking about it, but they've used the excuse of we're drug dealers, we're gang members. This is why they can come after us. But you know what? We're not going to allow, you know, rioting and, and, and looting to take place here. Fuck it. Do the Starbucks. Do the Target. Don't cut. Don't bring that shit into this neighborhood. Um, and again, it's a it's a great thing that would have helped a mainstream audience that had gone to the, see this film because of the popularity of the book to understand what they have to deal with. King's store, I'm sorry, Maverick's store is firebombed by King because he wants to get back at Maverick and his kids for, for you know, for what they could potentially do to him. And the opportuni- opportunistic way that he is, um, it, it, it gets represented not – I'm sorry. The opportunism doesn't just get represented in people like King who want to destroy these places because it's a great time to, to, to take out a rival or to take out someone who can, who can uh, be, serve as a witness to you. 
but there's also this, you know, the opportunism that comes from uh, people like at, 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 at star school, like I said earlier, when they decide, Hey, we're just going to have a, we're going to go and have a, a protest, you know, like Haley's going to organize a protest at the school because the kid who got shot in star feels like, Oh man, people are listening. People are coming together. And you see that now because there's some people who are willing to risk their security, their safety, relationships, because they feel that this is the right thing to do. And there are other people that just want the fucking clout. And the clout chasers that are out there that are just holding up Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, posters or what, just to get their one photo in front of the protest or with a protest or whatever some of the worst fucking human beings possible uh, because they're using somebody else's pain, some other family's pain. In fact, I think they're worse than the looters. They're using somebody else's pain to get famous, to get a few more Instagram likes, get some more followers, and then just fucking forget it when it, when it's there. Um, or, I'm sorry, forget it when it's convenient because it doesn't matter to them anymore. They can hold a black lives matter uh, poster up, they can wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, but if they're just doing it for fucking clout, they're showing that that, that cause does not matter to them. They're just there to, to show other people like, hey, I'm cool with black people, as opposed to the folks that are seriously out there communicating, organizing, marching, and not looking for this cute moment to say, you know, I was there, I participated. Um, but star herself again it, it's 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 a great uh, performance by uh, amanda she shows the pain that these communities go through on a daily basis that they go through because it's it's she has to deal with the pressure the societal pressure at home but then she also has to deal with the societal expectations at school and she finally has that moment where she says, fuck it, you know, because her friend Haley doesn't like the fact that, you know, uh, she posted some pictures of, of, of Emmett Till and other people, victims of violence. And she has this breaking point, which, you know, a lot of black people have had. And I would say even recently have had where, like, I'm fucking tired of talking about this. I'm tired of having to explain this to people where. You know, she pulls out a hairbrush and holds it like a gun over Haley and just fucking tells her, like, are, do I scare you now? Do I scare you? Am I scary? Because she has this whole thing of like, oh, you're not like them. And just talking about how, like, you don't fucking know me. You don't know my life. You don't know what I've been through. You just know this image that I've created for you that is comfortable. It's something that. Racism was over because Obama got elected. Because they voted for Obama, they couldn't be racist. I would have voted for Obama a third time if I could. <laughs> I would have put up two black oh, squares, two black squares on my profile pictures if I could. Are you gonna wear? Kent, are you gonna wear kente cloth to work now? Yes, I'm gonna buy it from uh, from white corporations <laughs> looking to make money. The same place I get my Black Lives Matter shirts. Okay, so I'm being sarcastic, but really, like, man, I'm looking around and and I see a lot of this. And the number one thing that I see that really drove me crazy, you know, I live in Phoenix and the protests were all downtown, right? Downtown right. Phoenix. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of looters went to the Scottsdale Mall, which is a really nice mall. Mm-hmm. And uh, and absolutely nowhere near the protests. <laughs> and, uh, and and I think it's ridiculous that protests got blamed for this when, you know, Jake Paul was there. And uh, yeah, you know, it was, it was like a bunch of white kids breaking into stuff like Crate and Barrel and the Apple Store and Urban Outfitters. Well, that, and, that was the first sign, because when I saw that, it was it was hilarious on Twitter when people were like, 
Yeah, that's definitely not black people because we're not going to Urban Outfitters and we're not going to I forgot what the other store uh, anthropology or some shit like we're not going to those places. And then you see which was very clear that that what uh, Aaron Paul or Logan Paul or whichever one of them it was. And he Jake. just got arrested the other Jake uh, just got arrested the other day because, hey, you know, he's a, he's a YouTuber and, you know, or Instagram or whatever the hell he does. And kind of like, hey, I, I want to show that I'm out there and starting shit which again is i don't get so uh on on a friend's wall on facebook they were talking about how you know there was the uh the guy who shot looters in omaha i believe it was okay and uh so all my nebraska friends were talking and people i don't know like friends of friends were like they should have shot more of them for being out there so i was like well a bunch of like white teenage girls were breaking into shit in the scottsdale mall should we shoot them too and the conversation died, and nobody posted anything. Yeah, you got else. your crickets at that point. I, I don't. I don't have more story. That's my whole story. <laughs> um. So you talked a bit about the book. Yes. And my favorite scene is not in the book. Uh, which, which scene is that? That would be when Sakani takes his father's gun and points it at everybody. <laughs> And oh then, yeah, yeah, yeah. I and, think what is and then Star stands, nine years old. Yeah, yeah, he's little. I, I, I would even probably go smaller than that, like six or seven. But anyway, so and then Star, of course, puts up her hands and stands between him and everybody else because the fucking cops are pointing guns at this little kid, and yeah, he's holding a gun. But do you need to shoot him over it? Because I feel like you could probably walk over and pick him the fuck up. Right. Well, you've got a couple of things going on there. One, you know, that's that's a nod to me. Rice, who um, I forgot how quickly the police shot him. But it was if you're not familiar with Tamir Rice, he was uh, I think an eight, eight or nine year old kid playing with a toy gun in a park or water gun in a park. Police got a call that there was a kid in the park with gun. They rolled and immediately shot him. Um, but but of course, it also goes back to the, the main point of the book, which is, you know, if, if you show these kids hatred, that's what they're going to learn. And here he is in a very volatile situation and seeing what his his sisters had to go through, what his dad has had, to, you know, his, his neighbors have probably complained about or what and what he's seeing there in the midst of these riots. Like, you know, King just tried to kill his sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of like, you know, I don't give a shit now. I'm going to try to burn my family. Yeah. You start to understand this is the acceptable way to get out of it, as opposed to there are other ways that we can we can handle this. There are other ways to deal with this situation. And, and in the book and I, I'm 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 uh, I'm hopefully I'm remembering the, the, the ending to, to King. But uh, if I remember correctly, like seven and his mother had like basically when testified to the police, like, Hey, he's dealing drugs. He's got drugs here, 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 and here. This is where you go get it. These are the guys you can bust. And, you know, it becomes kind of a, a happy ending or a mini happy ending in the book um, where King and all of his, his minions get, get tossed and, and thrown into jail because he's a, he's a, I guess a, a, a mid-level drug kingpin. But what, what, is really remarkable in the film that gets cut out and is one of the reasons a lot of people did not like the uncle in the in the movie as opposed to the book. You see Common playing Seven's, as you mean, well, he's all their uncles, but uh, Star's uncle, and you don't like him at all. You know, he's, he's Uncle Carlos, and he's the the brother-in-law to um, he's the brother-in-law to Maverick. So you don't like him in the movie because he even gets caught up in the cop way of doing things like, hey, are you sure your friend uh, Khalil didn't have a gun? You know, he's he's given kind of all the canned responses and canned questions about no, like, to, to I mean, excuse this. Like you were and, telling me beforehand how different he is in the book. And oh, I fucking hated him in the film. Oh, you're not I, alone. Everyone I appreciate saw... his honesty uh-huh. where he says, uh, 
I would tell him to put his hands up. But outside of that, I wanted to punch this motherfucker the entire time. Yeah. All right, Everyone continue. Everyone I, I, I spoke to who had seen the movie said the same thing. Like, I fucking hated Carlos. And after reading the book, I hated Carlos in the in the movie. Because in the in the book, it's he's he is that loving, doting uncle. Like, I'm not gonna let anybody fuck with my nieces and nephews. Because I I can't remember in the book whether he had kids or not, but it's clear like he is a dad for them when Maverick is in jail. So, you know, when Maverick's out, Maverick goes back to being the dad. When when Carlos is he's basically like the, their stand in dad and he forms a relationship with them where he's still the uncle. But it, it's he's a father figure at the same time. He doesn't see these kids as as anything other than his kids. Like he even, you know, in the book, he's like, well, you know what? Fuck it. They can all come live with me. All of you can love, live with me over in this area of, uh, of, of Chicago. You can live with me. And you get into another aspect of. Of, of what's known as is is uh, the black exodus as far as like uh, middle class and upper class black people leaving black neighborhoods and going and living in predominantly white neighborhoods, which is where Carlos lives. So there's like this whole interaction of of somebody, I think, calling the cops on seven or Sakani because they're out playing and they weren't used to seeing any black kids in the neighborhood. So you're, you're seeing all these things take place of no matter where you go, you're not safe. You know, even when you go to the quote unquote better part of town or the better neighborhood, you're still not safe. But Uncle Carlos is great in the book because there's this moment where he approaches the other officer and it's it's more insinuated than written down. But he goes, finds the other officer, asks him what happened and then beats the shit out of him. Like he shows up, he leaves for work, he comes back from work early and Star notices that he has bruises on his bruises and cuts on his knuckles. And he just says something to the effect of like, oh, yeah, I had a conversation with that cop that pulled you over. And you understand that Uncle Carlos doesn't fucking play. <laughs> and but in in even in the book, there is that conversation about like, you know, what would you do if 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 you had pulled us or pulled him over? I would have, you know, asked him to, to see his hands. I would have told him to put his hands up. I wouldn't have fired it. And Starlin's like, are you sure you would have? And it's that moment he starts to question like, shit, have I been so conditioned to where I see these kids as a threat too? Am I so conditioned to where they're in a certain neighborhood? I automatically think that they're up to no good. And, you know, Star goes from, oh, shit, I'm at a party I shouldn't be at to holy shit I've got to worry about where wherever I go someone might be a threat to me someone might hurt me someone might do x y and z and you start to question the whole system because it's no longer about this one cop it's why the fuck has he not been arrested why is he not in jail why has he not been dealt with um because in the film he gets let off he does he doesn't see justice you know, it's the grand jury comes back and says, oh, well, there's not enough to charge this guy with it. And that's really why the riots explode or the cities explode into violence, because it's the same story they've been told over and over again. If you believe in the law, the law is going to work for you. If you do the right thing, you know, you, you don't have anything to worry about. But here you are seeing how the system is and it just becomes more infuriating and more frustrating to where, you know, something I think it was. Um, something as simple as he didn't use his turn signal or they were just they were at the stop sign too long is a death sentence now. Or I have what's perceived to be a counterfeit, you know, bill. It's a death sentence. I'm playing selling, in a park. Yeah. Selling cigarettes. Sell, yeah. Selling cigarettes, selling CDs that the store owner said, I don't give a shit. You can go sell them outside. If you've ever been to. Some parts of the South. Have you ever been to Mexico? Store owners just don't give a shit. It's just kind of like if somebody fucking tells you no, just don't leave them alone. It was somebody went and complained and said, I think that guy out there has a gun. I'm calling the police. It's Baton Rouge. Some parts of Baton Rouge, you need a fucking gun. So I want to I want to flip this for a little bit into okay. another conversation. I want to talk about Chris. OK. Oh, white Chris. White Chris. And uh, what kind of plain ass name is that? <laughs> when first off, you know, you mentioned him with uh, he doesn't see color. 
And the one thing that I like about Chris is even though he's the one who says he doesn't see color, he's the one who's legitimately trying to understand. Right. And uh, and you don't get that a lot in films. Usually the guy who says I don't see color is also just portrayed to be a fucking dick the entire time. Uh, I like We're trying that, to shut down the conversation. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he's he's really there to help people identify when they don't understand. That's the point of this character. Right. It's it's a white door, if you will. And uh, I I love how like when they're kissing, the white girls walk by and like stare at them, and stars like they don't have the balls to say it to our faces, you know. Uh, I like the progression throughout. He's always trying to understand. He's mm-hmm. the one who spends the time. And, and who understands her enough that he realizes she's the witness, you know, like he doesn't get it as fast as her friends in Garden Heights, but he gets it. He figures it out because he spent enough time with her. Uh, her best friends can't figure it out. Her supposed best friends. Right. And uh, what I love most about White Chris is he doesn't give a shit about prom. He cares about her. Right. Prom is this almighty like. Like this thing that's worshipped, you know, among that age. And the fact that he cares about her instead of prom, as dumb as it is, that worked really well for me. Like that was such a kicker that he's truly 100 percent on her side. And then he takes her home and and we get my actual favorite scene in this film where he meets her dad. (laughs) And that moment when dad figures out that everybody's known except him is so great to me because he just pauses and he's like, wait a minute, does Sakani know about this? <laughs> right. I love that. That was so impactful to me, but it is, it's such a thing. And, uh, you know, usually you see it from the other point of view. It's usually the white guy who's like, what do you mean you have a black boyfriend? Why wasn't I told about this? Right. So it was nice to see it from the other point of view there. Or being once. chased off with a shotgun. Absolutely. And uh, or, you know, having the cops called on him. But it was nice to see that other point of view. But it also it just works so well on multiple levels. Like, I truly love this character of Chris because he is the white door and he is there to help us understand. But he's also there to teach a fucking lesson. And that mm-hmm. lesson is All you have to do is try. Try to fucking understand. Try to learn more. Be open. Fucking listen. And none of that's jammed down our throat. He's just a good example of it. And he's such good writing in that regard. And I just, I fucking love his character. So I wanted to talk about him. Well, and I guarantee you, if, if, if you had a conversation with Chris about white privilege, he would not be immediately turned off and be like, oh, because I'm white, I, you know, I have a better life. Like, no, 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 no. That's not what we're talking about. He, he seems like it's for him. And, and they go into this in detail in the book about he has like all these all these shoes, all these Jordans and all these different gaming systems at his house and, you know, instrument like the, his bedroom. The way it's described in the book is bigger than Star's house. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's. Just that idea of like he understands who she is, but he wants to know more about her uh, to the point where he's like, oh, well, how come I've never, you know, you won't let me go by your house or come pick you up or anything like that. It, and so for her, it's it's a it's a safety issue or what she argues is a safety issue for him. Not that anybody's going to beat him up for being white, but it's it's about the dad. It's like, I don't know if my dad would be cool with this one because I'm a teenage girl and he probably doesn't want me dating at all. And then two, you're, uh, you know, uh, an upper upper class white kid. And, you know, that that has all different types of, uh, uh, of weight appro- uh, attached to it. Like, what is that going to mean for our future? Because there are a lot of there are a lot of people have had. And that's another part of the talk. And I hate to really fuck with anybody's head right now. I mean, I'm coming from a different generation, but I had the talk with my mom. And I think my dad had this this part of the talk as well. Our sex talk, because that's typically the talk that that kids have mainstream talk. And when we say the talk, it's kind of like saying the pill. You know what we're talking about? The talk with my mom was when she when she knew I was, I, you know, went out with girls of different different backgrounds, different ethnicities. 
when it came to white girls, my mom, mom said, you need to be very fucking careful. And I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure she said the F word back then. You need to be very careful. And I'm like, what the fuck? Because I'm thinking, like, I grew up on military bases. I saw black and brown and white and Asian. I saw everybody together. You know, my my, my doofy, disconnected from reality, sheltered, uh, you know, shielded uh, perspective on life. I'm like, what the fuck? Racism is over. The Cosbys are on the goddamn TV. And (laughs) she would say, you know, you need to be very careful with them. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then she told me, she's like, if they tell you at any time to stop, you fucking stop. If they say no, you don't pursue any further than that. But she made this specific to any white girls that might be interested in me or I might be interested in. And I didn't get it at the time, but I'm like, okay, that's a fucking weird suggestion. Given, Of course, if a girl says no, I leave her alone. She's like, you don't understand. She might like you, but her parents aren't gonna aren't necessarily gonna like you. The parents won't approve of it, and so her thing was always worried. Like, well, you know, I, I'm gonna be worried if you ask a girl out or if you go out with a girl because there are gonna be a lot of people that don't like it. There are gonna be a lot of people that don't appreciate. And my mom dated white guys back in the 70s, so she was still sitting there, was like, there are people who aren't gonna like it, and she understood that there was a difference between a white guy dating a black girl and a black guy dating a white girl. And that's still something that, that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people have to deal with, which is um, that disapproval that people still have. There's a fucking website. I'm not even going to give them the dignity of mentioning their name. There are fucking white supremacists, alt-right, proud boy, three percenter, um, you know, websites out there. That list the names and locations of white women who would fuck and have fucked, married, or had kids with black and brown guys. And wow. it's, it's, it's as a warning to all the rest of you. Hey, don't get with this woman because you'll be, you know, you know you'll be muddying your, your genes or your lineage or something by getting around with them. I mean, it's that fucking crazy where people do shit like that. And I did appreciate the fact that they included Chris or at least gave Chris more of a voice without changing who he was from the book to the movie, because you get to see that idea of I don't fucking understand and I'm uncomfortable with understanding. And as opposed to rejecting something that's going to teach me about it, I want to fucking learn. I want to learn. I want to understand because I want to understand what I can do to fix this. And the great thing that, that he actually learns is, one, he can't fix it alone. And then two, it's not his responsibility to fix it. It's his responsibility to be an ally, to be an advocate, to if somebody is saying some racist shit, you fucking shut them down. And that's for anybody who's listening. Like, if you're not racist, that's not enough. You got to be anti-racist. So when somebody tells you that that fucked up joke, you know, call them on it or just do it is what James has explained several times. Ask them <laughs> to explain what it means. Oh, man, that's fun. It's so I, much I, fun. Look, I've I've been around my share of racist jokes because somebody forgot I was in the fucking room. And the, the, the sight on their face or the look of their face when they realize I'm there is like a combination of, oh, fuck. Maybe he didn't hear it. Maybe he didn't hear it. Maybe he didn't hear it. And I'm like, ah. Oh, OK, uh, OK, you you get a black guy to stop raping a white woman by throwing a basketball. OK, gotcha. All right. Cool. Gotcha. Let me just write Understood. that down in case I'm in that situation. Thank you for the advice. Yeah. Always carry a basketball. Um, <laughs> speaking of which, you know, th- this movie gets into that that wall that's also created between black and white communities, not not intentionally. But just because of, of where we live, where we grow up geographically, who we're exposed to, class, like all these things that start to mix together and start to start to help us understand. There's a great conversation that gets into black and white relations. And it is Seven interviewing Chris because he's the older brother. Like, let me see what this motherfucker's up to, you know, see who he is. And so they start having this question about. You know, who's better, Big Ear Tupac? Oh, who's better? Than, oh, who do you like here? And then they ask this one question of, I mean, kind of like checking his street cred. But then they ask this one question that's great, and I laughed my ass off when I was reading it. 
And it was, and they included, I think they included in the film, which is, hey, it's macaroni, che- macaroni and cheese, a side dish or a meal. And he immediately is so fucking proud of himself. He's like, macaroni and cheese is a meal. And the three other, you know, Seven, uh, uh, Star, and Seven's date all look at him like, you were so close. You fucked up. <laughs> you were so close. You are so close to being in with us, but you fucked up. You know, meanwhile, all this shit is going on, and Chris doesn't realize, like, how much he's calming or really calming and soothing Star that, you know, they can now laugh at this moment about how he doesn't understand for black people, macaroni and cheese is a side dish. For white communities, typically, it's a main dish. And so he's like, what do you talk about? Like, you can eat it. You can put this in it. But... And they're like, what? Out of a box? What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> you put them in the you don't put them on the stove. You put them on the in the oven. What the fuck is wrong with you? And just kind of that idea of like, well, you're welcome. You're here. Um, but yeah, the, the 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 film itself, I would I would include in horror because it has all those aspects of it might not be a fear I'm comfortable with. Well, let me go back. There's so many horror films where it, it involves no shit that would actually happen to any of us. That with this film, it's stuff that can happen to someone you know. Whether you're black or white, it doesn't matter. It can happen to someone that you know, you know of. I don't fucking know George Floyd, but I know what happened. I know what his family is going through. I can understand that. I can understand the pain because when 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 those videos make it online... People who think it's it's, you know, um, it's about George Floyd, as far as misunderstanding that it's about George Floyd. It's about George Floyd and everybody who came before him. So when people say like, oh, well, why did this one how are why are people focusing on on this one guy? They're not. This becomes like that tipping point, that catalyst to get more people involved, because when you see that fucking video, you can't excuse that. You can't excuse this cop sitting on this guy's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And you can't excuse two pieces of shit in 1954, excuse me, 1955 uh, for murdering a child because their wife claimed that he had whistled at them and then dumping, you know, shooting him, hanging him, burning him, throwing his body into the fucking Tallahatchie river and then claiming Well, you know, they were well within their right as white. The testimony from that case is ridiculous, by the way, the Emmett Till case. They were well within their right to protect uh, the their their white women. And I think that even came from the judge. And I don't want to, you know, well, fuck it. He's he's a piece of shit, too. Um, (laughs) The the attorneys in the case basically made the statement, the defense attorney you know, did his job. The prosecuting attorney did a half ass job because he knew what, what it meant if he got a prosecution out of this. But the defense attorney is basically stipulated, well, all you good white men on the jury know what your duty is. And that was code for, well, this black kid was where he shouldn't have been. He shouldn't have been there. He shouldn't have been whistling at this white woman because we let one little black kid whistle at a white woman. Next thing you know, they're going to, you know, they're going to be showing up to your house asking to date your daughter. And there's so many levels that go into this. And I I was glad that I wish this film had actually come out this year. Um, And fortunately, I mean, it's had a couple of years. I, I think more people would be receptive to it or at least feel like they need to watch it because, but you know, at least to get to uh, the the understanding of what took place through a fictional account that's based off of reality. So for this, for me, it's it's a horror film because it's dealing with reality. It's dealing with what people have actually seen, what people have actually gone through. It's dealing in so many different layers. We're dealing with so many different layers of fear and identity and understanding who you are and fearing, you know, fearing, you know, owning who your true self is. To the point where Star's never going to get over this. I mean, this is a childhood friend. She witnessed him getting murdered in front of her face. It's not something to where, 
you know, the, the killer has, you know, we've been able to approach the killer and, you know, dump his body or burn him or, you know, do whatever you can that this that you typically see in a horror film where, you know, that you've gotten rid of the 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 monster here. You understand that the monster is not going to go away unless people do something. And with her being a, a 16 year old girl, the odds are she can't do it herself. <laughs> it's going to it's going to require systemic change to where. You know, you don't even see, you you can't even recognize the police officer's face uh, in the in the film anymore. And and and, um, and even in the, the book, there's this idea of like she can remember him, but she remembers his badge number more than anything else. But the idea of you don't need to attach a face to this problem. You need to attach the entire system to this, because if, if one person has done it and it hasn't been dealt with, the whole system is flawed. Because in, in, in the teaching profession, if there are teachers out there molesting students or in the in the church, if there are people out there molesting kids and they're not dealt with, they're not kicked out, they're not put in jail, they're not, you know, you, there's not a statement from from the organization saying that this is what we need to do going forward to make sure this never happens again. It's just going to ha- keep happening. That leads me into my final question very, very well. Um, so before we wrap this up, uh, the hardest question that I have for you is what can white people do to help? Ooh. And Ooh. I mean, actual examples, not, I don't know, have a fucking heart or listen. Oh like, God, you know, I wasn't going to go there. I know. I uh, know. No, I'm saying for our listeners, like I'm talking how to, uh, like, what's the best ways to learn? Like, give us some books. What's, okay. uh, I what's, uh, too, systemic man. change that we can make happen. Like, what the fuck should we be doing? Because, like, let's face it, we're we're ignoring it because it doesn't affect us. Well, the first thing I'm because, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll go ahead and do a, a shameless plug first. Um, I would highly re- recommend a book that I wrote. Um, it, it came it was a cathartic experience, but it, it came out of these these instances, these incidents where I felt like, holy shit, you know, people aren't listening. And I'm tired of like only being able to speak to my students about these issues or people within my own circle, um, the the token black guide. But as far as as far as what people can actually do, there's a lot of reading out there, um, and, and I'll and I'll list some of those and I'll, and I'll I'll just uh, post them as well uh, to social media. Uh, but I think the the one of the biggest things that people can do is listen. And I don't mean like go up to your black friends and or 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 any of your your minority friends, your your friends of color and say, like, hey, tell me what it's like to be X. What I think is going to have to take is within schools looking at the curriculum. I hate to kill a mockingbird. Now, as an adult, I hate it because I think it's made so many people OK with casual racism that they don't see. I'm sorry, with with overt racism that they don't see casual racism. And they treat it as if it's something that, oh, you know, if I just say the right things, it's it's not going to be racist or it's not going to be offensive. Um, I think a good substitute for To Kill a Mockingbird would be something like Why the Caged Bird Sings, where you're getting an actual experience from someone of color, a, a female of color, Dr. Maya Angelou. You're getting that experience of what they went through. Um, you there's Ibrahim uh, X. Kendi's How Not to Be a Racist uh, or How to Be an Anti-Racist. I'm sorry. Um, but also it, it, going back to curriculum, talking, going to the school board meetings and and looking at the curriculum, bringing the curriculum to their attention and saying, like, what is not being addressed? Because unfortunately, a lot of history and a lot of the literature that we have in schools is very Eurocentric and it's not very colorful. There's, there's a, uh, a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Lee Bibu, who had a course a few years ago and he might still teach it every now and then called the end of whiteness. And he got the attention of Fox news because no one looked at the syllabus. He's an English professor and he teaches about literature and he was talking about, or at least the course was about, diversifying your reading 
because what that ends up doing is it, it gets you a, a better understanding of people's experiences. I think uh, he might have had Native Son. He had uh, Sandra Cisneros, um, Amy Tan. Like there were a good number of uh, authors from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different genders, genders, gender identities and sexual orientations that were included because it was about, you know, not, you know, white genocide or whatever bullshit stuff that people come up with. It was about showing that there are more stories than just white ones. Um, but I mean, there's there's stamped from the beginning. Uh, P- Howard Zinn's People's uh, History of the United States. I, I use that one in my courses. White Fragility. Um, Black Like Me. Uh, then there's also White Like Me, which is written by Tim Wise. Uh, let's see. The Color of Law, it talks about redlining and talks about, you know, which would be an important thing with respect to this film. The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin, the autobiography of Malcolm X, as told to Alex Haley, Between the World and Me. Let's see, what were some other ones? I, oh, The Color of Water is a good one. The Myth of Race. Um, the New Jim Crow is another good one. Liberation Historiography. Uh an African American and Latin X history of the United States, Ebony and Ivy, which talks about the the history of, of uh, our Ivy League institutions with respect to slavery. Um, what else do I have up there? Oh gosh, anything for that matter by Zora Neale Hurston, uh, anything by Langston Hughes, anything by James Baldwin. I, I recommended one thing, but anything by James Baldwin. Uh, Bell Hooks's Ain't I a Woman, or Ain't I a Woman, Black Woman and Feminism. Uh, and, oh, I, I'd be in real trouble if I didn't mention How We Get Free. Uh, but there are a lot of, of books out, out there that I would recommend reading. And what I would say, in addition to reading this, read those books, or at least read some of those books, and talk to other people who've read those books. Form some book circles where you can talk about these things. So it's not an issue of, hey, let me go ask my, you know, my one black friend or my one Hispanic friend about what their experiences were. Because I'll be honest with you, now is not a good time. <laughs> now is not a good time to ask those questions. And I don't mean that as as far as like they won't talk to you. I, what I mean is that collective trauma is still there. Um, so it's it's and, and plus we shouldn't be waiting until a traumatic experience. Uh, takes place to actually ask those questions. We should be asking those questions. Um, well, we should have been asking those questions years ago. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff that that you can get into. Um, of course, I'll, I'll send some to you, James, um, that we can post onto the social media links, our social media, um, and send out the links. Um, but some other things, there there are plenty of documentaries which Amazon Prime right now has just has like an entire uh, catalog that they've just re-release that deal with it so um anything on the civil rights movement and of course i I want to reiterate black history is not just about slavery and the civil rights movement uh there's science there's uh business there's arts there's a lot of things that can be can be discussed can be explored um and and i would highly suggest just going through to amazon prime because i think it's even like the first tab that comes up uh there are a there's there's a list of great documentaries that they have included uh, if you have Prime that you have included that I would suggest watching. Um, but then there are also plenty on on uh, PBS web pages, YouTube uh, that are out there. The one book that I would add to your list is Lovecraft Country. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the, the <laughs> it's reason definitely for the horror folks. Definitely. But also, I want you guys to understand this isn't about Lovecraft. Uh, It's about Jim Crow laws and the terrors of white people, basically. And uh, and I haven't told Don this yet, but I really want to break down every fucking episode as it comes out in August. So get on this book. Uh, It's it's yeah, it's just amazing. So read Lovecraft Country as well, or at the very least watch it when it drops in August and make sure you stop in here and download a bunch of episodes. Yeah. Cause we're def- You weren't going to have to ask me. We were going to do it anyway. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm not crazy, <laughs> but yeah. Um, 
Let's see. Do I have any final thoughts on this that I want to add that I haven't gotten the chance to? Um, I guess my main thing, going back to Chris for just a second, one okay. thing I forgot to add. I love how comfortable he is at the protest. Like, he's not scared. He's He wants to be there for her. And I thought that that was really powerful because they could have easily had him go full like, oh, my God, what is this? Right. And instead, he he just accepts. He's like, no, I'm fucking here for you. I'm not leaving you. And then she says, this is what I need from you. And he doesn't say no. He says, OK. Yeah. And he doesn't become the white savior either. Exactly. He, I mean, he's, he's a white savior for the two that he gets out of there. But well, but I mean, like, but he plays the role as, she gives him. Right. Which, again, was a was a great job by the author and also by the filmmaker um, to not have that become the story. Yep. Or at least it, it doesn't become that story or the, the thing that's carrying the story, uh, which unfortunately, you know, shit, when, when 12 Years a Slave came out, if you would looked at the promotions for it, especially the promotions that went into Europe, you thought Brad Pitt was the star of the fucking movie. Because it, it it was it was promoted without including uh, um, oh my gosh Lupita Nyong'o or um, so I'm going to say David Oyelowo but that's a different actor um, but anyway without without talking about Sa- Solomon Northrup's character and story it was more about hey here's this white guy who goes to the south and like completely disagrees with slavery and helps these people get free. Um, which was great that 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 did not become part of it. You still gave agency to Star. She still got to control what was taking place in, in her neighborhood and also within her own narrative. Uh, speaking of which, I, I will also recommend this uh, for any listeners out there. Feel free to watch my power of the narrative TED talk that I gave uh, back in February because it gets into the same issues of uh Talking, telling these stories, listening to these stories to actually understand uh, what people are going through, because there are a lot of times that, you know, you can't tell what someone's experience is by their appearance, what they've gone through. You know, if somebody's successful, you don't know the shit that they might have gone through. And I forgot um, because I I don't want to misquote this and I don't want to attribute it to the wrong person. But we often see the product of the hard work, but we don't see the work. We often see the image that's presented to us, but we don't see the backstory of, of what's going on or what people had gone through to get to where they are now. And I think that's very important, especially with respect to, to race, uh, the discussion about police brutality or, or, or uh, police reform itself, understanding exactly how we as a country, as a society, as a world have gotten to this point where this isn't just a 50 state protest that's taking place. This shit is gone worldwide. I've had students in China checking on me to, to see if I was OK. Like literally texting me uh, to, to see if, if things were OK and wanted to learn more. Um, so I mean, it, it gives you an idea of how big one this movement is, but then also how much people have kind of not paid attention to what was going on or just the level of frustration that people have reached. Yeah. I I don't know a better place to end this. So do you have anything you want to add before we call it a day? um, I do not, but I will say this in, in addition to the, the recommendations that, that I gave earlier, uh, this would be a great time for, a renewed discussion to, to emerge about uh, getting rid of any Confederate imagery, Confederate monuments, uh, possibly getting rid of Confederate names on U.S. military installations, because yeah. it's all part of that same story. Beautiful. Uh, the final thing that I want to add um, is just I hate that every week – I have to worry if we're going to do another episode. I told you I wouldn't get through this without crying. I love you. I fucking hate that I know so many shitty people 
who will never deal with the things that my best friend deals with. And I hate that I can do a lot of things that you can't do. And I hate that you and I can both do a lot of things that mixed race people can't do at all. And I hate so much that we care about a fucking color of skin. And, and I know, I know it's human nature and we'd find something else to be pissed off about it. If we all lost our eyesight tomorrow, it would be people with deep voices are great and everyone else sucks or whatever. I just, I fucking hate that humans need a reason to hate each other. And I, I wish that there was a way to have one day where everybody just did good things. And the amount of progress that we could make in that 24 hour period is insane. So. One, I pray that you're here next week, and I pray that my double cheeseburgers don't kick in, and I'm here next week. <laughs> and uh, and two, like I, I hope that I can find my humor again, because I've been very angry the last few weeks, and I know a lot of people are. I hate that I see a fire in Phoenix, and I assume that it's protesters, and I hate that everywhere I go, it's just people hating everybody whether it's oh protesters did this or cops did this or whatever and i'm guilty of it as well and i just i just wish that this could all fucking stop and i don't know i don't i don't have a good tie-in for all of this i just needed to get that out if there if anything anything good comes of this hopefully a lot but if anything good comes of this um it's that people are at least talking or more people are talking than not talking currently more people are being active with their social media uh without expecting the the clout to be received from it or um you know or trying to take like i saw fucking justin bieber justin bieber has been using his social media and is like i'm i'm the fucking one who's wrong like i should have been saying this a long time ago and you know if you have a platform and this isn't just with respect to race, if you have a platform where you can speak on, you know, for mar marginalized people or speak up for, you know, uh, issues of justice and you're not doing it, you're not helping anyone. I, I highly suggest if you have the ability, you know, whatever your privilege might be as for, you know, you got, 10,000 followers on TikTok or Twitter or wherever, you know, and, and you know something's not wrong, don't be J.K. Rowling. Um, use your use your notoriety, use your fame, use your followers to, one, learn, but then also use it to 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 elevate others and amplify, you know, the, the reach that that they definitely need. You know, J.K. should probably realize that anybody that's gone to war with Harry Potter is on the wrong side of shit. Yeah. All right. So I don't know what we're doing next week. Oh, we're doing Shaun of the Dead next week. That's right. Yes, we are. That's right. Shaun of the Dead next week with Doug Moreno, who's a Bram Stoker award winning editor and uh, some guy that put up with me in college for countless years. So that'll be fun. <laughs> So until then, I am James Sabata. And I am Don Guillory. And, and I am Don Guillory. <laughs> you don't sound nearly as angry anymore, second Don Guillory. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> and we'll see you next week here on the Necronoma.com. <laughs>